all being well. Okay, so welcome to this evening's talk. Uh, my name's Kate Sheard. I'm Community Wildlife Manager for the Barks, Books and Ox and Wildlife Trust. And uh, we're joined tonight by our excellent speaker, Mick Jones. Uh, Mick is our volunteer warden at Dancer's End, and he will be presenting this evening about the history of Dancer's End, and we're celebrating its 80th anniversary as a nature reserve. So hopefully you are all in the right place, and that's what you were expecting. And if you do have any questions throughout Mick's talk, please, uh, if you could try and use the Q&A function, uh, just so then it doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, happy for you to make comments and things like that in the chat, but if you do have specific questions, if you can use the Q&A function, that would be amazing. It'd help us out. Uh, it's probably about an hour, an hour and 10 minute talk, something like that. Mick's got a wealth of knowledge and information to share with us, so it might be a bit longer, uh, but just make sure, you know, go and grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee, something like that. Make sure you're sitting comfortably and, uh, and there'll be time for questions at the end. We'll do our best to answer them all, but if there's some things that we can't answer, Mick can produce a sheet or something, find out more information and we can send you links to that in a follow-up email as well. So Mick, I shall hand over to you if you want to share your screen. Thanks, Kate. I'm just going to share my screen now. and uh, set up the slideshow. OK, evening, everybody. Um, as Kate says, we've been celebrating um, uh, 80. Well, eight, we just got got to the end of our 81st year, actually, uh, because Dancer's End was uh, left to the Wildlife Trusts in November 1941. Uh, so we've been celebrating that year. We've been spending quite a lot, a lot of the time uh, trying to tell the story of Dancer's End, the history of Dancer's End. Uh, and really, this talk is a, is a sort of culmination of that. Uh, that uh, I want to share with you this evening. Um, hopefully, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, some things that you don't know about the reserve, even if you're people who have visited uh, quite frequently. Um, and uh, I'm going to really look at uh, how the reserve has developed um, uh, and how some of the attitudes to nature conservation have changed over that time. So let's get into it now. Um, the, 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 the picture at the top of this, incidentally, I, I change depending on the on the on the time of year I give a talk. And that is looking like now. So uh, if you haven't been recently, go before all the leaves fall. OK, so Dancer's End, um, a really special place for wildlife tucked away in a valley uh, between Tring and Wendover in the Chiltern Hills. Uh, this is actually looking from Hastow, uh, it just in Hertfordshire, the highest point in Hertfordshire, looking over one of the woodlands that we manage now and looking over the central part of the reserve and up towards the highest point in the Chilterns. I hope you can see my cursor because I'm going to be using it a bit. So the highest point in the Chilterns is up here, Aston, Aston Hill, uh, alongside Wendover Woods. And uh, um, you can see it's very difficult to get a sort of complete picture of the reserve, but you get a feeling of, of this sort of mosaic of woodland and uh, unimproved uh, grassland. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that. So just in a nutshell, first of all, um, Dancer's End is the, it's the largest and oldest of the Bebout Bucks Reserves. It's also the highest, I should have put that in really, 211 acres of woodland scrub and grassland. Uh, you can see that it goes uh, from uh, 560 feet to almost the highest point in the Chilterns, which is just one field away from the highest point on the reserve. And then a range of soil types, which is quite important uh, for the biodiversity of the reserve. Something like 380 species of vascular plants, 
over 620 species of fungi and slime molds, although both of those figures, I think, are slightly out of date now. 736 species of moths at the moment and uh, plenty of butterflies. And the main thing, I think, uh, that I want to uh, leave you with at the end is that uh, our whole approach to nature conservation has changed so that now we're working with neighbours in the valley, neighbouring farm, farmland and other landowners to conserve biodiversity more widely in the valley. And that's really the way we want to take things in the trust. Dancer's End is, has always been well known for its uh, wildflowers and some of which, well, quite a few of which, uh, uh, it's the only site in Buckinghamshire for that particular plant. Here's a little array of them uh, starting top left. That's wood vetch, certainly the only site in, in uh, the only uh, na native site in Buckinghamshire for that. Um, white helleborine moving along, uh, uh, greater butterfly orchid uh, in some years really prolific. Uh, the middle row at the left, that slender bed straw, which was extinct in the county and rediscovered and is now doing quite well in the valley. Um, one of the uh, ladies' mantles, the Alcamilla, this is Alcamilla xanthochlora in the centre there. Um, Blue Pimpernel, which is a very, very rare arable uh, weed now, which uh, has shown up at the reserve. The bottom line, Meadow Clary, it's the only site in Buckinghamshire, the only native, truly native site for Meadow Clary in Buckinghamshire, Basil Time, and one of our sort of special plants, really. Uh, we get hundreds of fly orchids, and this was a rather special one that uh, a, a, a particular variety uh, that showed up one year. And um, this slide just shows you uh, a nice little range of. Uh, Longhorn beetles, they were all recorded in, I think, I think over a two week period in June. Um, and it shows the sort of uh, variety that, that we've got really um, for uh, insects as well. Um, and so why is the reserve so rich? Uh, and how has it been looked after over the years and how has it developed? How have attitudes and the thinking changed over that time? And what does the future hold? So that's what I want to go through this evening. So I'm going to start <laughs> way back. You have to start at the beginning, really, uh, but I'm not going to labour it. I'm going to go from the Cretaceous period to the JCB period, uh, but fairly rapidly. So don't worry too much. Um, so 100 million years ago, there was massive global warming. That rings a bell, doesn't it? Um, and there was a, a really enormous sea level rise. And where we are at the moment was a, a part of a shallow tropical sea across the whole of south, the southeast of England, teeming with life. And in that sea were lots of trillions of single cell with shells called coccoliths. And they gradually, as they died, they gradually accumulated on the seafloor to form a calcium rich goo, hundreds of meters thick. And this is what formed the chalk that is such a feature of the landscape uh, around Dancer's End today. We've got evidence that this period existed at the reserve. If I see a badger, a new badger digging, I always go through the spoil heap and quite often come across fossils like this one. This is an echinoid fossil. It's a, a fossil of a sea urchin and it's 80 million years old and we've pretty well uh, managed to get it to a, 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 a precise species. So, you know, this is not a, just a fanciful story. This is what, what was happening. Um, of course, where we are uh, at Dancer's End was not on, it was not on the globe where we are today. It was more somewhere around North Africa at that time. Uh, and then everything shifted around. Um, the next thing uh, to shift to 50 million years ago, 
two enormous events really influenced uh, the, uh, the, the Earth generally. First of all, some sort of catastrophic event, po probably the impact of an asteroid that uh, 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 killed off the dinosaurs. But secondly, a much bigger and slower collision of the African continental plate with the European continental plate. Um, and that eventually pushed up a lot of the land and formed the Alps. And it formed the Chilterns from the outer ripples of that major event. So we owe the sort of shape of our, um, our, our landform to that. And here is what what we were left with in the Chilterns, a, a, a line of uh, upland really stretching from southwest to uh, northeast with a, a northwest facing uh, scarp slope, steep slope, and then a, 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 a gradually sloping uh, dip slope down towards the London Basin and the Thames. And I just wanted to point out how uh, unique the position of uh, Dancer's End is uh, in this landscape. As I say, normally we'd be talking about um, a, a north face, uh, a northwest facing scarp slope of the Chilterns. But around Dancer's End, uh, uh, we've got this strange configuration with a sort of promontory that sticks out from the normal. This is the sort of normal, if you like, uh, northwest facing scarp slope going on towards Ivinghoe Beacon and Dunstable Downs. But here we've got this promontory that sticks out. Uh, so the high the high ground here is the white and the and the pink and the red. Um, and uh, because there's this promontory that stuck out, instantly the uh, the triangle there, the red triangle, is the highest point in, in the Chilterns, just alongside Wendover Woods. Uh, this is Tring up here, just to get your ba your bearings, Wendover over here. Um, Dancers End Reserve, as it is today, is outlined in blue. And you can see that it, it, um, it has a number of aspects and actually has quite a lot of south-facing um, slopes, which is unusual in the Chilterns. So these sort of slightly unique topographical features um, for Dancer's End have helped to make it uh, a particularly rich place for wildlife. So I'm going to leap ahead now to 12,000 years ago. Here's a picture of what it would have been like in 12,000 years ago. As you can see, the quality of photographs wasn't so quite so good in those days. This is my idea of what it might have been like with uh, woodland cover after the the the, uh, the, the sort of uh, glaciation, um, and uh, uh, lots and lots of woodland, and um, particularly down into the Vale of Aylesbury, where it would have been extremely marshy as well, and so um, three hundred. 3,000 years ago, we start to look at the really settling of the landscape by, um, hu by humans and, if you like, kind of controlling it, taming it, uh, uh, exploiting it. Uh, and here, uh, at this sort of time, the tops of the hills would largely have been cleared, probably, of uh, woodland. Um, um, areas that uh, would have been settled um, and at this time, we find evidence of Britain's oldest road, the Ridgeway, which runs from Ivinghoe Beacon uh, down to Overton Hill. Um, and it runs right past uh, uh, Dancers End Reserve. It runs along the eastern side of, of the reserve now. Here, this, this red star is, is Dancers End again. Um, so this was a major, a major route. Um, the probably the the Vale would have been very, very marshy, especially in winter, and the main uh, routes between settlements would have been on the higher ground, uh, the Ichneald Way, uh, as as it's become known. 
And just uh, out of interest, uh, we got and part of the press really uh, that uh, we've got features from that sort of period, the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, um, just to the right at the northern end of Dancers End Reserve. You can see this is our boundary along the northern end. And in, in our neighbor's land, uh, 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 Buckland Who, which is behind uh, Dancers End, the, the old Dancers End farmhouse. Um, I've known for some years this, this set of, of three uh, banks and ditches, really, really quite uh, dramatic ones on the ground. Going straight north-south up the steep, one of the steepest parts of the, of the hills here. And uh, when the Chilterns Conservation Board uh, 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 started their project on hill forts, they commissioned this work to produce LIDAR uh, uh, photographs. And looking at those, we were able to see very clearly uh, these features. And I got their archaeologists involved. And it turns out that it's a late Bronze Age or early Iron Age cross dike, um, not known um, exactly what uh, its function was, but probably some sort of tribal boundary, demarcating an area which one tribe had control over from another tribe. But but it's new, new and it remains to be actually investigated further. But back to the the sort of early history of the uh, uh, the Dancers End area, and um, what we find is that uh, as uh, the area became more uh, populated, uh, settlements would have formed along the spring line along the along the the base of the scarp slope in particular of the Chilterns. And then you'd start to get this sort of classic um, patchwork of, of land use really from down in the in the vale you would you would have perhaps had uh, 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 fishing ponds and you'd certainly have marshy areas in, in winter and then you'd have an area that could be cultivated then you'd have your your um, um, your, your settlement around the spring line, and then an area where um, the downs would be grazed by sheep, then uh, an area that was probably still the steeper slopes of the, of the hills, and then up onto the tops of the hills, which eventually often became a uh, common land uh, where uh, people in each parish were able to uh, collect uh, materials that they needed, but also graze animals. And we get this, this um, pattern along right the way along the Chilton Hills. Oh, sorry, wrong one. And um, in this part of the Chilterns in particular, it's led to these strip parishes, very long, thin parishes uh, going from sort of northwest to uh, southeast um, at a at a sort of 90 degree angle to the to the scarp slope of the Chilterns and uh, in the Dancers End area you can see these strip parishes really clearly so the uh, this one the, the sort of southwesterly one um, is Aston Clinton and then next to it is Buckland and then this is Drayton, Drayton Beesham. Um, these, these strip parishes actually extended further. So up on the top of the hills, you've got common land Buckland, but boundary changes meant, meant that they ab abruptly stopped at, at around uh, the place where Grim's Ditch cuts across. You can see here the, the reserve uh, marked in black and we stretch across three of these strip parishes. Um, so we have quite a lot of interesting archeological features associated with them. Um, this is uh, uh, something I've taken from a 
interactive piece that the Children's Conservation Board did. And it's just a reminder that during the medieval period, this part of the, uh, of the world would have been incredibly busy. All parts of that landscape in those strip parishes would have been used uh, from the marshes down in uh, uh, in the Vale right up to the, the common land. And it would have been very, very active. Um, here are some uh, maps that show the uh, the area around Dancer's End. I just want you to keep an eye on this, this sort of lozenge-shaped uh, 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 area that, that I've marked in in yellow because it'll crop up again later. So back in the 1500s um, you can see there's really a, a, a lot of uh, woodland, probably slightly more woodland actually than than there is now. Uh, but but in parts uh, where actually the Forestry Commission now have parts of Wendover Woods, it was much more open. So Aston Hill Common uh, was uh, a, a, an open area and over over to the uh, west as well was much more open where Wendover Woods now it, uh, has has clothed it all with trees. Uh, the Dancer's End bit, um, some of the, the open areas that we now have so wooded, uh, Sawfield Wood that's marked here is now the open area that we'll look at later, which is our extension fields. Um, up at the right on the top of the hills uh, was mostly heathland then, very acid. The, the clay with flints a cap capping to the chalk made it very acid, uh, which has mostly been lost now uh, through the application of lime and chalk to sweeten the field. So I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, you can see when we get to a, a later map, um, some of these uh, 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 these features are still showing. Um, it was interesting. There are some very, very strange shapes to the, to, to if you like, to the compartments uh, around uh, this area and um, with quite a lot of different ownership. And I haven't quite got to the bottom of why that should be. Uh, one of the areas to, to keep an eye on is this one here, which is uh, uh, known as an assart. It was an area cut out of the, the woodland. Uh, the fact that they would cut it out and uh, clear, the, clear, clear it so that it could be cultivated or grazed showed how, how um, valuable open land was. And we'll see that a little bit later as well. Um, here's a, a later map. You can see that lozenge shape again on a uh, on a I think an 18. Uh, I don't know. I'm covered on my uh, my view, so I can't see what what date I've got on that. Uh, and then and then the lidar uh, map shows us uh, lots of interesting things which we're only beginning to investigate. Lots of pits that we know on the ground uh, here. Some of them are saw pits. Uh, some of them are uh, mall pits where a chalky, uh, uh, a calcareous sort of clay was dug to spread on the, the heathy fields. And then we can see in some areas that are now covered in woodland, actually the remains of lynchets, which were cultivated terraces, uh, which I am aware of on the ground, but until we got the LIDAR pictures, we couldn't, um, if you like, prove. So lots of these features still to be seen in the woodland today. Uh, hollow ways like this one, where the main thoroughfares lead up through the wood or where they dragged a lot of timber out in the past, old banks and ditches marking uh, boundaries between different ownerships in the woodland, mall pits uh, or sometimes uh, pits where uh, flints were being dug out for, um, uh, for building purposes. And then along the edges, uh, the remains of old laid hedges, which have now become enormous, in some cases, uh, beech trees. So when we get to sort of the end of this, uh, this sort of medieval period, what we had really already was a complex, uh, small scale mosaic of, of landscape. We had hills and valleys with slopes of different aspects. We had different soil types, high forests, some coppice woodland that was very intensively managed, 
grassy clearings that have been made and grazed. Um, what some wall, uh, warm and well drained short grassland areas, and then wetter, colder clay areas. Uh, these small fields and clearings cut out of the woodland, um, and then disturbance from quarrying and um, uh, and uh, uh, track creation. Um, and often uh, the sort of natural succession through to woodland was being interrupted constantly in order to get local products. So we had a sort of perfect uh, small scale mosaic, sometimes heavily worked, um, periodically neglected, uh, but with a, a few catastrophic events at, at times, destructive events at times. But the whole thing added up to a sort of dynamic continuity, which gave the sort of richness of the reserve. So we come on to the 1800s and along came the Rothschilds who were very, very important to this area. Um, and uh, the, the branch of the Rothschild family that we're interested in settled in Tring, at Tring Mansion and Tring Park. And uh, they rented uh, this, uh, well, the whole Rothschild family uh, 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 grew up in, in the Frankfurt ghetto. You probably know the story of the, the five sons who were sent to the various uh, uh, financial centers in Europe. Uh, the one who came to uh, England uh, settled in Manchester initially, that was Nathan Meyer to Manchester, and then moved down to establish the bank in London. And at that time, they rented uh, Trigg Mansion from about 1833, and then bought it finally in the, the late 1800s. And this was uh, certainly the most interesting and, and uh, creative and in and, and and slightly weird branch of the Rothschild family. So it wasn't unusual uh, to, to see the grounds of Tring Mansion um, occupied by uh, exotic wild animals like zebras. And you will have seen photographs of uh, 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 Natty in particular driving uh, a, a, a coach uh, pulled by uh, zebras. Um, they were followed by other branches of the Rothschild family. Um, during the 1800s, there was an agricultural depression uh, generally in, in uh, our part of the country. Um, and there were many cheap farms in the Vale of Aylesbury. Um, this was partly, in, this is another interesting thing that might uh, ring bells today, that um, the, the farmers were being hit by uh, much cheaper grains from uh, the United States, even back then, undercutting them. And uh, there was this sort of de general depression. So there were cheap farms in the Vale between sort of 1830s and 1880s. Uh, the, the, the other aspect, other branches of the Rothschild family uh, took advantage of. And by 1890, I think seven Rothschild estates were established in the area. Um, so here we have a little collection of them. Uh, Wadsden at the top there. Um, uh, Green, Green Park um, uh, in Aston Clinton before, it, before that was uh, uh, destroyed, burnt down. And then some of you may know, adjacent to Wendover Woods, the uh, the sort of Swiss style chalet that was one of the hunting lodges. And all over, uh, you can find uh, buildings that are related to the Rothschilds. Um, and of course, all funded really essentially by uh, the Rothschild Bank, which was, uh, uh, I won't go into, that's another, another talk, but uh, that's why, they were um, all here and were able to treat this whole area as a, a, a sort of playground, really, uh, a place where they would have um, visitors, uh, they would have uh, guests, uh, weekend guests, um, very elaborate um, uh, parties and sport. 
So here, uh, top left, we have uh, the Rothschild staghounds meeting in Ivinghoe. Um, and then we have one of the, the Rothschilds on his fam favorite horse with hounds. Here we've got a typical, at the bottom, we've got a typical sort of um, uh, weekend uh, party in it, actually this one at, at Tring. And here you will see standing in the middle, Edward VII, who was a frequent visitor. And so were many of the, the, the important politicians from that time. The Rothschilds had this wonderful landscape all around them. They had the wonderful beech woods up, up on the, uh, the top of uh, Tring Park. And then they had all the, uh, the reservoirs, uh, Tring reservoirs, which were really uh, used as a, as, as, a, as a major hunting ground, uh, um, duck shooting and so on, which still carries on today on, uh, 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 under the Rothschild's uh, ownership. Um, and a lot of the uh, hamlets uh, really were uh, developing with uh, employees of the Rothschilds. Um, here we have a group of keepers uh, looking after probably the breeding of pheasants and then uh, a group uh, getting ready for a shooting party below on one of the Rothschild estates. And here, top right, we've got a, a, uh, an entry, uh, a newspaper entry um, from, I think it was, it was, oh, this was the Bucks Herald, and it was back in 1873. I'll just read it in case you, you can't quite pick that out. The Duke of Edinburgh's visit, and this was Prince Alfred, second son of Queen Victoria. It is our pleasing duty this week to record a visit played by Sir Anthony and Lady de Rothschild, paid to Sir Anthony and Lady de Rothschild by the Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness left town on Monday evening by the usual 8 p.m. train to which a saloon carriage was attached. Upon their arrival at Tring, carriages were waiting and conveyed the royal party to Aston Clinton. On Tuesday, the prince enjoyed some excellent shooting at the back of Aston Hill in the preserve known as the Plains. To the six guns comprising the party, upwards of 400 head of game fell. In the evening at dinner, covers were laid for 22. Well, the plains that's talked about there is Dancer's End Reserve. It, that's uh, Round Spring Wood. So what did the Rothschilds do for Dancer's End? Uh, well, for one thing, they made it the, um, the, the complete headquarters in the UK for uh, uh, an exotic uh, introduction, the Gliss Gliss, uh, for which they are not, uh, have not been thanked. Um, uh, we've got thousands and thousands of them around at Dancers End Reserve. And as many of you will know, um, they uh, do a lot of damage to uh, property in the area. Um, I won't go on about uh, why we control them earlier, but I think it's a bit too late now to uh, to get on top of that. Um, the other thing that they left for us in uh, the right in the sort of heart of the Dancers End Valley, incidentally, this this uh, uh, background photograph is looking from the uh, the southern end of Bittam's Wood uh, over the woodland towards Pavis and North Hill Wood. And you can see just poking out of the trees, this rather um, ornate uh, tower of uh, Dancers End pumping station. Um, they built the pumping station uh, in order to get uh, clean water for Tring and the surrounding villages after a whole series of outbreaks of cholera uh, and and the wells being um, uh, uh, contaminated. Um, this area, and this is this is a wonderful photograph I found from uh, Buckingham uh, uh, Aylesbury Museum, um, looking at the top end of the valley. Uh, 
this whole area had been already very busy with a whole series of chalk pits and lime kilns uh, to produce lime to take up to improve these these fields on the tops of the hills. Um, this is where they chose to sink a borehole in uh, 1886 and establish the the pumping station. Um, it, here it is with its uh, chimney back then. Uh, the steam engine is now down at Kew Bridge Steam Museum and you can see it working. Sadly, the chimney was was demolished. But just look at the state of the woodland behind. It was much more open. It was managed. You can see how how heavily uh, uh, harvested it would have been. But as a result, uh, lots more uh, sun uh, would would have been get, getting into the the ground layer. It would have been a very different place. You can see that just below the the woods, you had probably wonderful chalk um, downland turf above the chalk uh, quarries. Uh, very different today. Um, here's a picture from exactly the same spot. The superintendent's house on the the woodland now is is really really over overgrown but will, uh, and, and heavily shaded and and uh, um, even aged but we'll come to that in a minute so this this branch of the uh, Rothschild family we're interested in is uh, is shown in this uh, uh, family tree here and the ones we're interested in are the are really uh, first of all the the children of Nathan Meyer Rothschild or Natty, who was the first Baron Rothschild and became uh, MP for Aylesbury. Um, and the two, his two boys uh, were Lionel Walter, who was second Baron Rothschild and was also MP for um, Aylesbury. And then uh, his younger brother, uh, Nathaniel Charles. And then uh, one of Charles's uh, children, Miriam Rothschild. So those are the people we're going to be really interested in in terms of natural history. The reason I call it the cradle of nature conservation at Dancer's End is that it really was shaped by these people. Uh, and uh, as you will know, Charles uh, was the founder of the Wildlife Trusts. And I'm going to sketch that uh, that whole bit of history out a little bit. Walter, um, the older uh, uh, son, um, was uh, a strange character. I, it's another talk to go into into his detail. He was the person who uh, decided at the age of eight, I think it was, that he wanted to start a museum and his parents gave him a shed, but they also gave him access to a taxidermist, which not, not all children have. And that's when he started his museum, which eventually became the largest zoological collection in, in the world, at Tring, and is now part of the Natural History Museum. Um, uh, uh, enormous tall man, but, but very shy, uh, strange man uh, in in many ways. Uh, um, but he really uh, he really uh, devoted his life, as well as working at the bank, to the collection of of natural history, its study and its naming, if you like. His uh, younger brother Charles um, was just. Uh, besotted with uh, entomology, with insects, um, and also started to appreciate the habitats that uh, the insects needed. And he, if, if anything, uh, could be said to have been behind all the ideas about protecting and conserving nature. And then Miriam, his uh, daughter, uh, really took on uh, the uh, the role of uh, nature conservation on and was a prime mover in research in uh, ideas about the management of uh, of nature reserves and to mobilizing resources for their uh, their safeguarding and their future so these people were important the reason i call it the cradle of nature conservation is that the two boys um spent their childhood exploring areas of the 
uh, Rothschild estate. And the top end of the Dancers End Valley was where they used to do a lot of their butterfly collecting. And Miriam told me that this valley here, uh, part of the Krong, the Krong Valley, what we call now call the Krong Valley, was uh, where they did a lot of their butterfly collecting when they were probably no more than seven, eight, nine years old. And it was here where she, as a five-year-old, was brought by her uh, uncle and her father to collect marsh fritillary butterflies, a butterfly you won't find uh, in this area, although I have to adjust it. I used to say you wouldn't find it in this area, but recently there have been quite a few releases and it does appear to be hanging on. But for many years, it was extinct in, in, in Buckinghamshire and, uh, and some of the surrounding uh, counties. Here, uh, there's still the food plant, uh, plentiful supplies of the food plant, Devil's Bit Scavius, and who knows that the uh, marsh fritillary might find its way back sometime. This is looking at that part of the valley in the area. Sadly, the, the, the bit, this lovely south-facing slope here, which they uh, apparently did, did a lot of their collecting on, which, which still has small blue butterflies and lots of orchids. It's a local wildlife site, but we don't have it as part of the reserve. We'd love, we'd love to have it eventually. The, what we're planning to do is is around here where the steps go up into Bitterns Wood. We're going to have an information board about the the history of the Rothschild connection with the reserve and this uh, this period really when the two boys developed their ideas about uh, and their passion of, uh, for for uh, nature. So moving on to Charles, uh, who is the sort of most important of, of, of uh, the Rothschilds in terms of uh, the wildlife trusts. Um, he was an entomologist. Uh, he was a pioneer really of, of a lot of our, the ideas we take for granted today. He, um, here he is in Hungary actually at, at his parents-in-law farm as a, a youngish uh, man, always with his butterfly net. Um, he described, he became a sort of uh, really obsessed with fleas. He described over 500 sp species of fleas new to science, including unpacking the, the whole um, story of the uh, bu uh, bu 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 bubonic plague and the flea which uh, carried it. Um, and he catalogued over 30,000 uh, uh, fleas and his work was continued by Miriam, his, his daughter. Um, it was Charles who started the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves, which became the Wildlife Trusts. And in 1912, he called a meeting, uh, this poster is from, from that meeting, uh, to uh, uh, to get a group of people together who would join him in this endeavor. Um, he believed that areas had to be preserved uh, and not just left to chance. Um, the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves became the Wildlife Trust and eventually became the Wildlife Trust as we know them today. So this man um, was very important in our history. His, his idea was kind of new. Uh, it's difficult to, to believe now. He was so concerned about the landscape and the, uh, the destruction of habitat that he was, uh, the sort of places where he went to collect for his, uh, 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 his insect collections and so on. Um, he could see that uh, steam power was meaning that areas of the fens were being drained much faster than they had been previously. Um, areas of chalk downland that were steep, but that couldn't have been ploughed by horses, were suddenly being ploughed by machine, machinery and so on. And his idea was to acquire um, uh, areas as reserves. Uh, originally, he wanted to hand them to the National Trust, um, and he did that 
with uh, uh, Wiccan Fen, and you can see him here at Wiccan Fen. Um, but that whole idea broke down because soon afterwards the National Trust decided it wasn't very interested in uh, in uh, just just land. Uh, uh, it really wanted to concentrate on on fine houses and so on. Um, what he went on to do was to uh, survey and list uh, a whole series of sites across the UK, which he considered to be uh, so important that they had to be preserved. And these are now known as the Rothschild reserves. You can see here, incidentally, before I move on, uh, uh, one of the one of the first ones on his list, Albury Nowers, just outside Tring, which not quite uh, in our patch, but actually we had we had a lot to do with it uh, when it was being uh, made into a reserve uh, reserve, which is now the Hearts of Middlesex uh, Trust Reserve. Um, he went on to uh, list uh, 284 sites in the UK, 182 of those were English sites, and they're covered in this wonderful book, if you come across it, Rothschild Reserves, uh, written by his daughter Miriam and Peter Maron. Um, a fascinating read, which looks at all the sites he mentioned and how they fared over time and what's happened to them. And just looking on the left here at the the map that uh, he he had of all sites that he considered to be important um, in the box there, I've just listed ones that are in our area, um, uh, and uh, a, a number of which are still uh, being looked after by Bebout. Um, so it still has a lot of relevance today. Interestingly, some are really quite strange. Uh, uh, down here, Dorney Wood was a, a relatively uninteresting piece of woodland, very close to Burnham Beaches, but he didn't seem to mention Burnham Beaches. But that could, could be because it was already uh, being looked after. Um, the files of his 284 places are still uh, in the headquarters of the Wildlife Trust, and they're in old boxes from the bank, from the Rothschild Bank in London. And uh, each each sort of uh, uh, little file contains maps and notes that, that he made. So this is uh, Charles really setting up the whole idea of nature reserves and, and telling people uh, key, key places that needed to be protected. Interestingly, that that list doesn't include Dancer's End, and I'm just going to explain why. By the time he was doing that piece of work, he'd already uh, protected Dancer's End, and so it wasn't considered uh, necessary to mention it. Um, the story of that is that uh, in 1922, um, there was the breakup of the Holton estate. Um, uh, the Rothschilds who had Holton, uh, incidentally, the, all the area that the old uh, Dancer's End Reserve in was part of the, the Holton estate, stretching over to the Dancer's End Valley where it met the Tring estate. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, the Rothschild who had the Holton estate, and he died uh, without heir. Um, the Holton estate had already been largely taken over or extensive areas have been taken over by the Ministry of Defence uh, uh, to do uh, initially to do with uh, army uh, camps uh, uh, and training areas in this in the First World War and then the airfield and so on um, and uh, also large areas of the uh, old beech woodland had, had been clear felled actually during the First World War um, and so the old Holton estate had, had been really quite quite devastated uh, by uh, his death um, in 1917. He, because he he died without heir, he passed the estate on to his nephew Lionel de Rothschild, um, and he uh, initially uh, was interested, but then decided he 
didn't really take to Holton at all. He was obsessed with creating gardens and he wanted to assemble a great collection of rhododendrons. And when he was when he inherited Holton, he discovered that it was all chalk. And that was hopeless for, for, for his sort of dream. So he decided to sell um, the whole of Holton Estate and he went on to buy the 2,600 acre Exbury Estate down in the New Forest, which is well worth a visit as well. So here we have um, a newspaper piece uh, in 1922 uh, listing the uh, properties in the liquidation of uh, Holton Park Estate. And you can see it includes Dancer's End Farm, Aston Hill Farm, various cottages, uh, woods, ballads, tapnels, Bradnidge Woods. Um, interestingly, the woods that aren't mentioned um, are uh, the woods that we have in the reserve, Brown Spring Wood and um, um i can't think anyway the um the two woodlands uh, areas we have and that's because such to be and he persuaded them to let him have uh, those two those areas uh, a private nature reserve so effectively from 1922 dancer's end was a private nature reserve and here we have uh, the the shape of the the original nature reserve so as i say this was from 1922 it was being looked after if you like but looked after more like a game re a game reserve uh, with still with pheasant shooting and so on i think and then um charles uh, uh, actually uh, had died S only a year after he managed to safeguard uh, the Dancer's End area. He died in uh, 1923 uh, by his own hand uh, after a serious illness uh, at only 46 years old, which was tragic, really. Um, uh, in 1941, uh, his uh, son and daughter, Victor and Mary, passed the uh, freehold of the reserve over to the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves, which Charles had set up. So it became one of a little group of about eight or nine reserves that then the society um, owned. And uh, this is the original sign at Dancer's End, which I found under scrub. It had just been thrown, thrown away. Um, so this is from around 1941 or shortly afterwards. Um, and interestingly, uh, the management of areas like this then, I mean, no one knew what to do really with nature reserves. The closest uh, they could get to uh, managing them was was really um, um, gamekeeping. Uh, I suppose that was the model that they had. So basically, uh, securing them in some way, keeping people out uh, was what they thought they needed to do. And also stemming, if you like, four years, they decided that local uh, volunteer wardens who they appointed should have these armbands uh, and uh, that saying SBNR warden, which I wish we still have had an example today, but we don't. But apparently they were told that they could use any means within the law to safeguard the wildlife and stop people entering the area. Um, so that was this kind of attitude back then. They didn't really know uh, what they were going to do with these areas and lots of problems were going to arise. Um, if you look back, uh, the reasons for having uh, Dancer's End as a reserve are really quoted as uh, the Chilton gentians, the fine uh, displays of Chilton gentians, uh, the presence of, of meadow clary as a very rare plant, uh, butterflies like the Duke of Burgundy, and uh, uh, moths, day flying moths like the uh, uh, narrow bordered five spot uh, burnet moth. Uh, 
Miriam Rothschild said that she had discovered a, a what she called the Tring variety of the narrow bordered five spot burnet. And in my early days uh, looking after the reserve, occasionally I'd get a letter saying, "How is it doing on the reserve?" And I'm afraid no one knew how to how to actually identify this moth. So we we used to just say, "Oh well, uh, the food plants do still doing very well." Um, then we got uh, really a series of disasters for the reserve. So in 1943, um, we had uh, clear felling of the woods uh, as part of the, the war effort, um, which many woodland owners were encouraged to do. Um, and then uh, in 1945, uh, uh, around that sort of time, uh, areas adjacent to the reserve were plowed up uh, again as part of the the uh, the uh, to, uh, uh, produce more food within the country at, at, towards the end of the war and so uh, this area was plowed up here and uh, uh, a, a lot of the fields to the on the eastern side of the reserve were plowed here's a shot looking um over uh, towards the reserve from the waterworks uh, an RAF shot in in 1938 and you can see that uh, um, at that time uh, the uh, some of the woodland had al already been cleared you can see it quite open here uh, you can see that adjacent were lots of uh, per lots of permanent grassland this was all permanent grassland really here we had uh, orchards being planted i'm fairly sure they were uh, Aylesbury prune orchards uh, adjacent to the reserve. Um, at this time, we know from the files that uh, there was a lot of work done by Italian prisoners of war. This is a, an illustration from the Imperial War Museum, um, and they were involved in, in cultivating some of the areas and digging a trench through to, for water supplies uh, to the other, the other side of the reserve. Um, here we have a, a, a fantastic aerial photograph of post-war Dancers End, 1947. Here's that lozenge shape again, which is the area we now call Ant Hill. But the interesting thing here is that Round Spring Wood up here and uh, Bittem's Wood down here are completely open. Can you see they they were clear fell? And um, Time, I mean, a sort of uh, a perfect time uh, in in the area, which uh, we can only dream about today, um, as the sort of uh, area was just left to scrub and to to regenerate on its own. Um, it was full of woodlarks, tree tree pipits, uh, grasshopper warbler, uh, nightingales, nightjars, um, wood tiger moth was uh, uh, prolific. Uh, wood white, lots of wood white flowers, and then both pearl bordered high brown fritillary. High brown fritillary now, you'd have to go down to uh, um, uh, near Exmoor or up to the Morecambe Bay area to find. But in one year, back uh, back during this period between 46 and 55 it was said to be so prolific on the bushes that you could you could just pick it off by hand. Um, and then another catastrophe, uh, 1954, uh, mixed mitosis uh, uh, broke out and the rabbit population uh, was almost wiped out. And that meant some of the clearings uh, in the woodland, some of the open clearings uh, were no longer being, being kept open and uh, started to scrub over. And then further catastrophe really 1955 the the new forestry commission uh uh was being invited to replant uh a lot of the woodland because the country was bothered about the the difficulties they'd had with timber supplies um during the war um so the two big woodland areas at Dancers End were replanted with a beach mainly and a, a coniferous nurse crop, uh, a mix of Norway spruce larch and Douglas fir. Um, 
a disaster really when uh, in terms of biodiversity when you think how rich the site was um and also it led to losses through neglect because apart from this central area which was really the the area that was being managed as a reserve the rest was on a uh, on a long lease to the forest commission and some of those areas were designated not to be replanted uh, but uh, they were meant to be kept as as uh, for their interest in nature but they were just left to their own devices and because there was no grazing uh, by rabbits and so on they they quickly became well my scrub and at that point we lost uh, juniper from the reserve uh, uh, wild candy tuft and lily of the valley just moving on to uh miriam um Miriam was a, a born naturalist. Uh, she didn't have any formal schooling. She escaped, used to escape from the schoolroom out into the estate uh, and really, really became completely self-taught. Uh, and she is the person who uh, really took Charles's ideas forward and made sure that the, 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 the dream he had uh, continued. Um, here she is. Uh, performing a lot of her experiments and uh, work on uh, often work to do with uh, sort of the biochemistry of the interactions between insects and plants uh, in the kitchen at home. Here in the, the sort of early days of the uh, the reserve, when it was still being looked after by the SPNR, uh, you had uh, uh, it really just managing this central area, what we now call the meadow plots and ant hill. And Miriam uh, was joined by Susan Cowdy, uh, a local uh, naturalist and someone who was very influential because she knew all the uh, the rich landowners coming coming herself from the Stuart Liberty family living up at the Lee. Uh, so between them, they uh, led this, this uh, sort of management committee for the reserve. Here you can see, Lady, uh, as well as Susan Cowdy, Lady Barlow, who was the granddaughter of uh, 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 Charles Darwin was involved as well, and other people, Terry Wells, uh, Ken Williamson, from the British Trust for Ornithology, uh, who were then in Tring, was on the management committee as well. Miriam had uh, got very fed up with villagers coming in and collecting primroses uh, at the uh, during the Easter period, and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, baskets full and even digging plants up for sale as well. So she had these these signs made, and as you can see, the the, the sign writer misread her. Uh, writing and and they ended up saying danger's end uh, when it was pointed out to Miriam she said oh that's okay that'll help to keep the buggers out uh, which was her sort of style um, she went on to a keen interest in dancers and carried on managing the uh, uh, chairing the management committee and actually carried out a whole series of experiments to see how the central area the the cleared area could be could be uh, brought back uh, from being scrubbed over and her work really was it was the first sort of serious effort to look at the reclamation of chalk grassland uh, from uh, scrubbing over and she used a whole mixture of uh, uh, animals, uh, different sorts of sheep, goats, uh, lots of uh, employees from the Rothschild estate to uh, uh, try and get rid of the scrub. Um, then the next stage was uh, 1968, Bebout took over the central area uh, of the reserve. Um, and uh, here, uh, Bebout had now got to the stage where it had quite a lot of reserves in the Chilterns and uh, it was chaired, the regional committee was chaired by Arthur Mount on the left here, who also was at the warden for Dancer's End. Susan Cowdy, as I say, was still heavily involved and she was president of the Buckinghamshire part of uh, the, the, the what was then the Naturalist Trust. Um, 
Arthur started uh, what was known as the Buckinghamshire Conservation Corps, which was a sort of group of volunteers uh, to do work on reserves, which was a completely new idea at the time. Just in terms of attitudes, it's worth note looking at one of the old signs. You can see here, you can just see it. It says entry for members only. And that was very much the attitude then. So um, the next, um, so I, I got involved around 1980, 1981 uh, with carrying on really managing largely this central, this central area and a little bit of work in the surrounding woodlands. But we'd always wanted to uh, take on the waterworks area as well. So that was our next kind of expansion into uh, the area immediately around the reservoirs and the waterworks and the little uh, um, field opposite the Cron Meadow in 1987. We knew it was fantastic for things like bee orchids, uh, zigzag clover, uh, slow worms, uh, marsh tit, which uh, is still uh, probably it's still probably one of the best places to see them in in uh, in Buckinghamshire. Um, so eventually, after years of trying, we were successful uh, through the help of Alistair Driver, who was then the conservation officer at Thames. And here we get a picture of uh, in the local paper of the, the handover of of uh, those two areas, one on a, a, a long term, uh, not a long term, on a on a short uh, license, uh, an annual license to manage, and then the Crong Meadow on a on a lease. And here you'll see uh, Miriam Rothschild, who came along uh, for the sort of handover, and and it was during this time that she told us quite a lot of these stories about the history. Uh, she's with uh, Susan Cowdy over to the right, and Peggy Varley, who was then chair of trustees for. The, the trust and that's Alistair Driver on the left who went on uh, to have a, a major career with the environment agency uh, and now runs Re rewilding Britain I'm the chap hiding behind them here then with uh, uh, darker hair um, and uh, uh, very much the sort of uh, uh, rookie of the bunch um, that area of the waterworks uh, was very heavily scrubbed over, and uh, although we 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 attempted to sort of uh, rescue it with uh, uh, volunteer efforts, eventually we persuaded Thames to provide some money, and in 1991 we uh, got contractors in and cleared a lot of it, and it went on to uh, all the newly opened areas became fantastic places for Chilton Gentian, thousands and thousands of, of plants, and also uh, the bear areas, um, we realised were, were really important for uh, a number of insects, particularly mining bees, and this is this year with lots of uh, of IB. You can see one just disappearing to, into one of the holes here. Uh, it, it also recovered from all the, the sort of som like conditions after the contractors to have uh, um, fantastic shows of orchids. And you can see completely covered at times with bird's foot trefoil and uh, a kidney vetch. And we managed to keep um, uh, small blue going up there and it still it still is there um then we moved from bebont to bebout <clears throat> and a period when the trust was getting in, you know increasingly uh, um, large uh a vast increase in members uh and uh volunteers as well and the land uh, managed uh was uh, really quite significant and and the whole trust was being professionalized no longer run by volunteer groups um we in the dancers end area and and the sort of chilton's area uh, uh, uh developed a, a real uh, hardcore of of volunteers uh some of whom you'll probably recognize here and there was still plenty to do at dancers end uh for these people uh the Scrub, uh, uh, despite all our efforts, was still uh, uh, sort of 
really kind of taking over more and more of the cleared areas, especially dogwood. It looks lovely in the autumn, uh, but we have to stop it just swamping everything. And parts of the uh, woodland that had been much more open were, were now closing up. So we had a lot of uh, oak, uh, clearing and coppicing work to be done. Um, our next venture was to get much more involved with uh, a, a neighbour to the north of the reserve uh, and help with the management of this lovely south grassland uh, to the north. And this uh, we knew had lots of horseshoe vetch. It had this very rare plant, slender bed straw, um, and we put a lot of effort in uh, helping uh, to manage it. And Having got fed up with uh, not being able to get grazing at uh, the right time from local farmers, um, uh, I, I, I took a, a, a leap and bought 10 Hebridean sheep to graze the reserve and our neighbours land all year round. So we just moved them around uh, the valley, really. Eventually, they got absorbed into the uh, uh, bebout flock of, of, of sheep. Uh, as the trust started to to get its own uh, supply of animals. Our volunteer group went from strength to strength uh, and has always been a, a joy uh, really to to have working on the reserve and, and nearby reserves. Uh, they aren't always sitting around like this. This was a, a, a rather pleasant lunch break. Um, the next e expansion of the reserve was in 2000 when we got the opportunity to buy uh, these fields uh, uh, that, that went right up to uh, the road from Aston Hill towards Chivery, very close to the highest point in the Chilterns. Ex-arable fields, they'd been arable uh, since uh, they were ploughed at the end of the Second World War. Uh, so 50 to 60 years of arable and then just down as a, a grass lay uh, with rye grass. Uh, you can see them, uh, the two fields here in an old photograph. And we, uh, at the time, uh, we, uh, the trust was thinking of a project to save chalk grassland, it had a major project, funded project, and the Dancer's End uh, part of it became an where we were going to uh, uh, restore chalk grassland on these arable fields. And uh, the funding that we got from uh, landfill money largely enabled us to get kit to do this. So you can hear, see here the alpine tractor that we managed to, to get. Um, after a period of, of just trying to reduce the nutrient level by changing the grazing, we decided we really had to uh, reseed. Uh, a, a large portion of it if we were going to restore it quickly, more quickly than, than if you like, <laughs> uh, centuries. Um, and here uh, you can see we actually sprayed with herbicide, two lots of herbicide, just to get rid of the, 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 the coarser grasses and the, the thistles and so on that, that were taking over and then reseeded with uh, a chalk grassland mix uh, uh, from known uh, sites. And then we also got uh, our favourite conservation tool, the JCB or the digger in uh, to create some scrapes back into the raw chalk uh, so that we would have really low nutrient areas where some of the very special plants could, could thrive. And it looked like uh, an incredible uh, incredible mess initially, and local people thought we were creating a, a, a golf course and we had to explain what on earth we were up to. Uh, we had, just just by disturbing the, the, the old arable fields, we got some amazing results of the things like the blue pimpernel cropping up, some of the arable weeds like roundleaf fluellen, top right there, and then uh, plants like uh, corn marigold and cornflower actually popped up uh, over the next uh, few years occasionally. Our volunteers were used to collect uh, seed from the adjacent uh, very rich chalk grassland that our neighbour owns and also from elsewhere on the reserve and that was used to spread on the, the scrapes. Uh, 
within two years, uh, this is one of the uh, the edge of one of the scrapes. We had we had the plants we wanted coming up, a kidney vetch uh, plant for the small blue butterfly, and large thyme uh, showing really really well here. And then within the next few years, we had uh, rare plants like basil thyme cropping up, uh, brought over by uh, cattle uh, coming between our neighbour's land and our land. And then our first Chilton gentian showing up just from a, a little handful of seeds being, being scattered from the Chilton gentians at the waterworks. And then over the years, we found that uh, uh, it's fantastic on these fields for insects as well. Top left is uh, the hornet robber fly, really quite a, a rare um, uh, insect, which uh, appears to be doing very well. Um, dark green fritillary has, has taken a liking to the fields, and we see quite a number each year. Uh, 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 a longhorn beetle that we haven't seen elsewhere on the reserve, tawny longhorn, uh, showed up there, and some lovely beetles like this colourful rove beetle. And uh, during migration time, because we're close to the highest point in the Chilterns and we've got these, these chalk scrapes, we get uh, birds like wheat ear calling in and we see wind chat and stone chat sometimes. And I guess sometimes there are even uh, uh, ring oozles as they are at, at uh, Ivinghoe and Steps Hill, but I don't think I'm ever there early enough in the day. We use a grazier with cattle, uh, and the idea is to have low level uh, cattle grazing all year round and just move them between the different compartments. And mostly that's working. It didn't work over the last year very well. Um, here you see just eight, eight years, I think this was after uh, reseeding. This is what part of the grassland was looking for, looking like. We didn't get this overall because it was really only only uh, only as good as this, where the chalk was very close to the surface. But this shows what what we were able to achieve. And then recently we uh, dug another sort of linear scrape, uh, linking some of the uh, older scrapes to to give some more shelter uh, for the butterflies, a, a deeper uh, sheltered area because it really is very windy up on this. Uh, uh, these slopes. And this is already carpeted with uh, just two, two to three years on, this is already carpeted with uh, some of the plants that we wanted to establish. Here's a little summary of what we've done up on those fields. Uh, these are the, the three original scrapes here. This is the later one in uh, 2020 that we had linking two of them together. Shortly, we're going to actually be planting up, uh, surprisingly, perhaps to some 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 scrub and and uh, 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 trees, uh, but in a in a sort of patchwork uh, that will mean that eventually it'll become an, a, a sort of wood pasture area, which will be much better for some of our breeding birds, and then. We're also constructing a, a, a new pond with further butterfly banks around it, um, which I'll say more about in just a second or two. Um, the latest real big success here is that over the last couple of years, the, the horseshoe vetch that we introduced uh, from seed and plug plants has been very successful. And the last two years, we've seen chalk hill blue. Um, uh, starting to colonize. No evidence of breeding yet, but we've certainly had males visiting. And then our last little bit of empire building uh, was in 2011, when we took over the woodland on the uh, other side of the valley uh, from the old reserve. Uh, so this is paved this wood, North Hill Wood and Blackwood. Uh, an area of, uh, in some cases, much more mature beech woodland than we've got on the main reserve, and some lovely areas of mitch, mixed woodland, although really rather sort of neglected over the years and uh, and, and rather sort of ev even aged and, and really very shady. Lovely at this time of the year, looking uh, around the Krong uh, uh, Valley, uh, a fantastic little bit of woodland. 
But what we didn't anticipate when we took it on was that ash dieback was only a year or two away. And so what we've got um, now is really quite a headache of clearing a lot of the ash trees which are uh, infected and are close to uh, bridleways uh, and the network of paths that go through these woods. So right at this very moment, we've got machinery like this operating up there. Um, and a lot of that timber will be collected in the, the drier conditions in the summer, but quite a lot will have to be left to, on the steeper slopes to, to just rot down. But it will create lots of new glades and open areas for us. So what we've had over the years is, is really a, a whole collection of, uh, of, of events and uh, if you like, uh, management, different management periods at the reserve, which have led to this really objective for us of having this varied habitat mosaic, the sort of as many different uh, habitats as possible. And um, what about the future for Dancer's End? Well, we're in the middle at the moment of a two year Rothschild Foundation funded project, which is enabling us to carry out some um, some enhancement work on the reserve. And we're really pleased with the way that's going. And one of the things we're doing is working with neighbours. Uh, so we've got projects helping to uh, make some of their land uh, much better for wildlife and to link across uh, uh, to uh, the reserve. Uh, we've got uh, uh, new fencing that we've been able to do, which means we can have improved grazing on the reserve. We've got better kits. So as well as the Alpine tractor, we've now got a cutter collector instead of the volunteers having to rake up all the cuttings all the time. Hopefully um, we'll have a machine that collects all that and, and, and kind of bales it up. Uh, to be taken away and we're going to be producing a whole lot of new signage and interpretation on the reserve including uh, interpretation that covers this sort of history that I talked about today. Um, we're digging a new pond we've never had any uh, open water on the reserve so there's an opportunity on those that extension uh, those extension fields to, to to have a new pond but we're going to have further scrapes and scrub belts on that area as well. And we're going to have improved facilities in the forge at the Waterworks, which is our centre for volunteers, and it'll enable us to do more there and to run training courses and so on. And this is hot off the press because this is earlier on today, we were actually digging the pond and I just thought I'd like to throw this in this evening. So the, all these photographs were taken today. This is looking actually from our neighbour's slope down onto the, the extension fields. This is where the pond is, is going, situated and all every, today we had the digger finishing off the, the deeper section of, of the, the pond and then laying all the underlay uh, which protects the uh, the uh, waterproof layer here and then uh, then help with help from the digger driver uh, the role the hev very heavy role of uh, uh, waterproof uh, butyl uh, ready to roll out and then here the volunteers uh, uh, putting that into position so this is all happened today. It's it's another little step in our uh, plans to continue to make Dancers End an absolutely fantastic place uh, for the future. So thanks very much for listening this evening. Sorry, it's gone on a little bit longer than planned. Thanks very much, Mick. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? I will do. Okay, cool. So really interesting talk. I've learned a lot. I've, I've worked for BBAMP for just over eight years. So <laughs> there's, there's still lots to learn. And hopefully your pond will be filling up nicely because where I am, it's absolutely tipping it down. So hopefully there's rain over Dancer's End as well. So it'll be filling up your pond quite nicely this evening. Well, we hope so, because then then the, some of the overlay won't, won't uh, blow away. Yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs>
um so there's there's one question that's come through at the minute that says why did the cattle grazing in the last year not work as effectively as other years oh yeah okay uh yeah it, quite important this um our grazier and, and this is this is a lesson we had to learn uh our grazier had uh, some problems with TB testing of their herd. What we hadn't realized when we entered into an arrangement with them is, is that their farm is just in Hertfordshire. <laughs> and when it, even though the, uh, the herd had been cleared, uh, the rules, the DEFRA rules, uh, stopped them moving their cattle over the border because Hertfordshire is a low risk uh area for, for for bovine tb and uh buckinghamshire is a high risk so suddenly we discovered that we couldn't get the cattle grazing that we normally have on the the extension fields um they gave us sheep instead uh, as many as they could uh, uh use with with some lambs but that really didn't do the job we wanted and in fact it was it was counterproductive because the sheep just actually uh, uh, prioritize grazing off all the flower heads <laughs> instead of the sort of grazing that we've been used to from the cattle we really do do need cattle grazing on that land so we've we've had to think hard about um if you like mitigating against this happening again hopefully it won't be a problem this next year but we do have some some backup plans in case it happens again because we we need the, the cattle grazing in particular and is there certain times a year that the cattle are on well we try we try and have them on from uh quite early sort of um, even end of march into april right the way through probably till uh october november if ideally just numbers that are uh that that, are, that we can move around between the th the three different fields and up onto our neighbor's land and that's proved to be to be really just right for what we want to achieve uh, but you know it's it, it, we you never get a sort of perfect year uh with with uh grazing yeah. brilliant thanks mick and i think that's it for the questions um so if, if anyone does have any more oh one's just popped in let's have a look uh so someone's put really wood other than the immediate issue of dealing with ash dieback are there any other plans for that side of the reserve um yeah there are i mean originally we had thought that uh because because those woods really don't have any open areas they don't really have any clearings uh we wanted to create a sort of stepping stone of clearings through those woods and uh wondered when it, when we would ever get uh, the energy and time to to do that um although ash dieback is is a major problem and is costing us quite a lot of money it's actually provided us with the solution to that because it's going to mean that we can now uh, build on the felling work that's happening and maintain a series of open areas through so it means that that area uh, of the that side of the the valley that's always been a bit dark and dismal uh, will have perhaps some of the butterflies uh, doing much better and so on it'll be a more interesting place generally i think after well it'll take a few years to tidy up after the the, the felling but after that i think it'll be a, a really improvement uh, in terms of uh, wildlife brilliant thanks mick um, so I just wanted to say that Mick runs regular guided walks at Dancer's End. So do join one of them. You can look, all the events are listed on the Bebout website as bebout.org.uk slash events. Um, and as part of the Rothschild funded project, we're trying to do a few more um, family friendly events um, with my team. Uh, so we had a really interesting moth evening. Um, and then some kind of bug hunting and mini beast hunts that we teamed up with the Natural History uh, Museum in Tring as well. Um, so they'll be happening sp spring, summer next year. So do, do check out our website. Uh, join Mick on one of his guided walks. It's a fantastic place. I saw my first purple emperor butterfly uh, mm. this summer as it went past. And I was like, oh my, what's that? And Mick was like, it's purple emperor. <laughs> so it was very exciting because you never know what you can see. 
Uh, but yeah, mix a wealth of knowledge and information. So I would highly recommend going on one of his guided walks. Uh, we are looking to put some more interpretation on the site. Fingers crossed for an audio trail as well. So you can you can listen to mixed dulcet tones as you explore the reserve as well. So it's kind of like watch this space, watch the website. Uh, and there's more things to come uh, between now and June next year. So I'd just like to thank everybody for coming and joining us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Massive thanks to Mick and his wealth of knowledge. And we shall let you all go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Kate. Cheers. Bye. Bye.